All right, well, uh, thank you, uh, ASCS fellows. Uh, so this is uh, part two of our um, session on shoulder arthroplasty. We thought we uh, would just focus really in on the exposure, uh, going through the humerus, uh, glenoid exposure and glenoid implantation, talking a little bit about anatomic and also reverse arthroplasty. And so how it's gonna be divided up is I will be uh, discussing really the delta pectoral exposure up into the humeral osteotomy and then uh, I think then Dr. Levine's going to take over and discuss um, another aspect of the exposure. And then finally, we're going to end off with uh, Joaquin. Is that is that fair, guys? Yeah, with glenoid exposure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you end off with glenoid exposure. All right, well, let's get started. So these are my personal disclosures. None of them are really relevant as it pertains to exposing the humerus. So really over the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna focus in on four particular areas. We'll talk a little bit about the positioning and we'll try to make this fun and entertaining. Uh, I'll ask Dr. Levine and Dr. Sanchez to tell how they position patients and how they're obviously doing it wrong. Uh, we'll go through the incision, some of the releases, and then end off with the humoral osteotomy, discuss the pros and cons of an intramedullary guide, an extramedullary guide, and a freehand cut. So starting with uh, total shoulder arthroplasty, I must admit I, I position my total shoulders the exact same way I position my reverse shoulders. Uh, would you guys agree? Do you guys do the same? Yes. Yeah. And yeah. so for me, it's uh, the beach chair position. I can, as you can see here, this is actually one of Dr. Levine's pictures. You can see his initials there. Um, and I think uh, looking at this picture, certainly uh, your beach chair position is somewhere around probably about 100, about 50 degrees or so. About. Say it again. It uh, looks, looks about 50 degrees. Yeah, probably. Somewhere around there. And so uh, I also do beach chair position. I tend to place mine a, a little bit closer to 30 degrees. Uh, I like to keep them fairly flat, only uh, just because we have um, anesthesia issues with cerebral perfusion and things like that. So that's why I like to keep them a little bit lower to avoid my anesthesiologist getting too anxious. Uh, and the other reason is by, I think by keeping them at 30 degrees, it just makes it a little bit easier for the humeral head to translate posteriorly with the effect of gravity. Uh, I also use an artic articulated arm positioner, as you can see here. Uh, and I know obviously Dr. Levine does because this is his picture. Joaquin, what about you? Do you use an articulated arm positioner? No, I actually base the patient's pretty vertical. So I would say mine is almost 70, actually. We call it the barber chair position. I think that term was also mentioned. Bill may know better by Dr. Nier, right? He talked in his wow. book the barber chair position. So we're basically right. sitting the patient as if we're going to get shaved in the old times in the nice New York barberies. And uh, in terms of um, um, the support of the arm, I use a Mayo stand, you know, being that Mayo Clinic, that's what I think I have to how, do. How original, Mayo stand at the Mayo Clinic. You got it. Yeah. Would you be so, would you be would you be fired if you didn't use a Mayo stand, Joaquin? Oh, you know, I use the spider for my arthroscopies, but for shoulder arthroplasty is the Mayo stand. That's okay. interesting. So Joaquin, you're at 70, uh, Bill, you're at about 50, and I'm at about 30. So I, I think uh, it seems like all those positions are, are, are reasonable. Why do you like to go so high, Joaquin? What, what do you feel the advantages of being at? Uh, so two things. But the main reason is that when I'm working on the glenoid, I get the impression that I can translate the humerus more posteriorly easier, or my assistant can, and I get a better idea of my glenoid orientation just because that's the way I have learned over the last 17 years. And Maybe I could get used to getting to see the glenoid more horizontal, but I already have that picture in my mind, and I think it helps me with my clocking of the component. So, so Joaquin, if I'm a fellow listening to this, I, I would be confused only because of one thing, because George said that he likes it at 30 degrees because he thinks gravity helps him with more posterior humeral subluxation. And while I don't do it in that position, that immediately struck me as, yeah, that makes sense but 90 degrees or 80 degrees doesn't make sense as much that you can get more posterior subluxation. What, to yeah. help, me, help me understand that. So the way I, I would think about that is that when you are exposing the glenoid, I think you have to move the humerus posterior inferiorly, not the straight posteriorly. So the way I place my retractor, the humerus is translated to the inferior quadrant of the glenoid. So in fact, gravity would pull the arm down. I see, okay. So you're both right, I guess. Yeah, we'll let them have that one. Um, so then with the uh, positioning of the scapula, this is all, uh, I position my shoulders different than I position my ladder J's. When I do a ladder J, I kind of support the medial board of the scapula with the back side of the, uh, the T-max or the chair that I, I use to position the patients. Do you guys leave the medial scapular border free or how do you, do you support the scapula? 
I do not make an effort to support the scapula and shoulder arthroplasty. Whatever it, lays, yeah. whatever it lays is fine with me. So I, I, I agree with that. So I tend to have my scapula unsupported and then I prep all the way to level uh, at almost the medial level of scapula. So I like to prep medially, posteriorly to the, the medial border of scapula, uh, anteriorly to the nipples, and then along the neck up to the ear lobe. So I like to get a nice wide uh, exposure uh, and a large prep area just in case. I mean, you always wonder if you're ever gonna have to go in from a posterior approach or things have to change that you have that area already prepped out. But uh, good question. Is there something you have done in your last five years for a skin prep or otherwise to decrease infection that you are convinced it's really helpful? Like just one minute. No. So we do a scrub with a, a scrub brush before we dry it. And then I use the chlorhexidine prep with sponges. The only thing that I've done differently in the last five years is I use vancomycin powder at the conclusion of the operation uh, intra in the arthrotomy. So actually touching the implant. And, and the reason I do that is some of the basic science uh, cell biology research we've done where we looked at DNA of P. acnes and we looked at the sample of tissue at the time of the initiation of the operation. There's no P. acnes or C. acnes DNA at that deep level. At the end of the operation when you're closing, there is. And so the only way it got there is we put it there. And so because we put it there, I feel we should put vancomycin powder there to prevent it from proliferating. So that's my reasoning. Uh, have I had an infection since I've done that? Yes, I've had um, actually since in the last, I should be very careful how I say this, but for primary joint arthroplasty, uh, since I've been doing that, I've had one infection in like five years. Uh, so I've been very happy with that. Uh, the nurse, I always position the nurse on the same side. I like the nurse on my side so that if she or he is preparing an implant, uh, I don't have to ask them for anything. I can take things off of their mail stand. But I know, Bill, you like them on the opposite side. See, and then Joaquin, how about yourself? Just like Bill, I like them on the opposite side. So we, we use a large ventric, one of those big, you know, things that have support on wheels on the feet of a patient. So I can still feed myself instruments very easily. But I feel very crowded if I have someone retracting on my left and then the nurse in my right if I'm doing a left arthroplasty, for example. So I have two people on the opposite side and two people on my side, four total. If I take uh, something off the Mayo stand myself, I live in New I work in New York, guys. I'll get my hand hit. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. And so uh, I use a general anesthetic for actually all of my joints and I get administer TXA you know, just a few minutes before incision start, usually one gram. Uh, Bill, I know you also use TXA, but you, you don't use a lot of paralysis. You have a certain percentage of your patients are uh, under conscious sedation with blocks. Yeah, we do probably at this point between 80 to 90% of patients are with regional anesthesia and sedation only. It's only if I'm doing a, one of the, you know, a post capsulography young male, heavy, mus heavy musculature, uh, where I know that it's going to be a more a difficult exposure and I want paralysis, uh, those will be the situations that I might ask the anesthesiologist. There are some anesthesiologists that are less comfortable. It doesn't matter to me, um, but it, it is nice to be able to not have to have to wake them up and just take them right out to the recovery room immediately after closure. So we love the patients okay with that? Like, uh, do they feel comfortable? They love it. They love it. I mean, they're, it's like a colonoscopy. You know, I tell them it's like a, a twilight anesthesia. So they don't they, they rarely remember anything. Um, and, um, but they, they do, per, you know, I have some patients that, you know, I had an 82 year old patient who's a very active woman. I did a reverse on last Wednesday and she absolutely refused to have general anesthesia unless it was, uh, uh, you know, medically and uh, medically necessary for her, for her health and well-being. So. How about you, Joaquin? Do you use general on most of your patients, some of your patients? Yeah, we use generally in all patients. I have tried uh, to do uh, what Bill is doing and my anesthesia team has declined. They want to have an airway and general anesthesia. I don't use paralysis unless I get in trouble. So I would say that 99% of the times I don't use paralysis and I do use an examic acid also. But I think if you're using a general anesthetic, the anesthesiologist probably use paralysis and that's usually effective for the first 30 to 40 minutes anyways. Yeah, they use some paralysis just enough for the intubation, but they don't go to zero to each you know, like to the real paralysis that will really make you feel that the shoulder is, is loose. And again, the reason I don't do it is because I'm so used to my soft tissue tension with some tone that I feel that if I were to change, maybe it will have more dislocations or instability. Hmm, interesting. 
Um, and so Steri-Drape, uh, as you can see, I do a very uh, similar prepping to Bill here. I, I actually use a Steri-Drape for uh, isolation and securing of the drapes. I don't like to put the Steri-Drape over the area of the incision. Uh, Joaquin, I think from what I recall, when I was your fellow, you actually, do you still uh, Steri-Drape over the incision? Yes. Yeah. Is that just by convention or do you find, do you have literature to support that? No, I think it's just because that's the way that we have been doing things. To be very, very honest, full disclosure, we have never looked into data in our practice to see if it's better or worse. But like you, I have had a hard time proving to myself that one change in what I do will change my infection rate because it's so low anyways. So it's hard for me to justify changes because the infection rate in primaries is very low. Uh, and I put this up there, adjusting lights. I like to adjust my lights before uh, I prep and drape. So I want my... I like a headlight coming in straight from the top and that's usually got the camera in it. And then I like to have one coming over my, the contralateral operative shoulder. So if I'm operating on the right, it's coming uh, uh, over my left shoulder and vice versa. And I like to position the lights before we start scrubbing our papers. I don't like to move them around. I find if I do move them around, I'm always nervous, like little particles of dust come down and things like that. But that's just a personal uh, pet peeve of mine. Um, so let's uh, move on to the video. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the incision. So this is where I like to make my incision. I like to make my incision about a centimeter uh, lateral to the coracoid. And Bill, I know like you like to make yours almost in line with the coracoid. And then Joaquin, you're on the far other extreme. You like to go about two to two and a half centimeters further lateral than the coracoid. So really no consistency. What that tells us is, is you can really make your incision wherever you like. Would you guys agree? Yes. Yeah, the only thing I, I don't understand why you guys like it more lateral because the work is going to be, you know, the vein is medial and our work is more medial and the glenoid is medial and you have a big deltoid and you're going to be hogging on that deltoid more if you are further lateral. So I, I, that I, I don't, I, I, you can do whatever you like, of course, but I, I don't know intuitively why that makes sense. For me, it makes sense is that, uh, so if, if I'm looking, I'm not sure what's going to present, but this is the glenoid. The more medial I make my incision, I feel like I'm off axis. I like to make it as lateral as possible. So I get a, uh, I, and when I feel I can get a smaller incision, I know that that's not very important, but I just feel like I'm fighting less skin uh, is, okay. is my reason. But you know, it's, 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 it's obviously doesn't make a difference. It's just like the 30 degrees of beach chair, the 50 degrees of beach yeah. chair, the 70 degrees of beach chair, they all work. Right. That's, what, that's what's interesting. We're all doing it a little bit differently and it's all working for us. All right, so let's start the video. Uh, the one thing I've also done is uh, I used to use the scalpel a lot and go right down to the muscle. And now with this P -acne, or C acne scare, I just score the skin and I use the cautery. And I'm not sure if that makes a difference, but it just makes me feel better that I'm maybe frying a few of those bacteria uh, on the way down. Uh, what do you guys do? You guys use scalpel or Bovi? Mets? Uh, I, I use Bovi. Joaquin? I use the scalpel to the delta is fashion, like to, to that level. And then after that, I use Bovi. And so I like to, I actually don't go looking for my cephalic vein. I let my cephalic vein find me. So uh, what I'm doing here is I'm going to go right up to the level of the delta attachment onto the clavicle. This was taught to me by uh, Dr. Cofield. And so there you can see we're looking at Morenham's triangle. There's gonna be pec major, and you can see the fat triangle, and there's the medial edge of the deltoid. So I'm just gonna develop the interval between the cephalic vein, which is gonna come in uh, medially there, and the most medial attachment of deltoid right there. And then typically what I'll do is I'll put in uh, either a Mayo retractor or Mayo band retractor. Uh, or a nest or a, a bent knee type retractor just to retract the upper uh, medial aspect of deltoid. And then this interval wants to be developed. I mean, it, it, the, the pectoralis major is in its own fascia, the deltoid is in its own fascia. So this interval wants to separate if you're in the right, if you're in the right plane, it'll want to separate. And so then I just start from proximal and work my way distal. And for me, I always take the cephalic vein medially. Uh, my partner, Ken Faber, just recently did a randomized prospective study where we looked at uh, medial versus lateral uh, positioning of the vein. And what we found is, is that arm circumference postoperatively with, as a measure of edema was significantly less uh, when the vein was moved medially. And the patency was actually higher with medial positioning of the vein than lateral. And that kind of makes sense when you, you think about us retracting on the deltoid for glenoid exposure. 
Uh, do you guys have a preference one way or the other now that I've quoted some ed evidence? <laughs> I do media by training like, like you, Jordan. I never changed, but I'm glad that you uh, were able to do that study because you're amazing at throwing high quality science at very important questions. Uh, we, we had two unbelievable fellows uh, that put that study together and they were very persistent. Actually, uh, one of your ex-residents, so, uh, Will Leibender and uh, um, uh, Bogdan Matash, uh, who uh, is now, was actually in, at NYU. And so they put that study together and they were very um, persistent at getting the patients come back, measuring the swelling and everything, and actually looked at ultrasound of the vein too. So uh, once I, I do my delta pectoral uh, approach here, I, I typically do things always the same way. I do a subconjoint release, subacromial and subdeltoid in that order. Subconjoint right here. I identify the CA ligament, go right underneath the inferior board of the CA ligament, and then sometimes work my way down here just to release any of the uh, ligament to structures on the base of the coracoid. So there's subconjoint, subacromial, free up that area and then subdeltoid, mobilize the deltoid off the proximal humerus and the greater uh, greater trochanter tuberosity, Mars, I guess. Do you, you ever take a little window of the CA ligament, uh, that inferior aspect, if you are if you want to have a little bit better exposure at the upper border of the subscap in the rotator interval? I, I haven't done that. Um, we just recently finished a biomechanical study looking specifically at the CA ligament as it pertains to acromial stresses. And it seems that per preservation of the CA ligament may be beneficial for decreasing chromial stresses. And I think the HSS group looked at that and they also found something similar. So, I mean, taking a little bit, I don't think makes a difference, uh, but certainly preserving the majority of it may actually make a difference to decrease the chromial insufficiency factors. Um, so here's the long head of biceps. I always find it the same spot. If it's not ruptured, just above the pec major, I dissect it out uh, distal to proximal uh, up to level the rotator interval and then make the turn towards the rotator interval. And I must admit, this is a little bit of an older video. Um, I did this video maybe about three or four years ago and I was always releasing the upper one to one and a half centimeters of pec major uh, and then Tina Deasing the long head of biceps to that release portion of the pec major. And now I've gone back to uh, sometimes preserving the pec major just because I feel like I don't need to release it anymore. Um, it's funny when I first started practice, I never released it. And then I started releasing it and I've gone back to preserving it. I, I don't think it makes a difference. Do you guys think it makes a difference one way or the other? Only in a very, 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 very tight shoulder. It may help you, but it's funny. I've gone through the same evolution. So I, I used to release it and now I don't do it anymore. Yeah. I don't release yeah, I, it, George. Yeah. I find yeah, exactly. So I, I think we could keep it. The one time I will release it exactly in a very tight or sometimes it's very muscular male patients. <laughs> But those are the ones you also have to be very careful when you release it because you don't want to release it and then have your glenoid retraction pop the rest of it off. And actually, fortunately, that's happened to me on one occasion where I was operating on a bodybuilder where I released the upper, what I thought was a centimeter, centimeter and a half. And it was such a difficult glenoid exposure that I actually popped off the rest of the pec while exposing the glenoids. I had to go back and fix that or I had to fix that at the end of the case. So here we are, I'm just going to tag the subscapularis. I like to tag it a little bit more medially so I don't burn through my stitch when I'm doing my peel, peel technique. And so then we're gonna remove the long head of biceps. I like to do, to do the tenodesis right at the beginning because uh, I know I used to save it for the end, but then half the time I'd forget to do it. So I think I do it right at the get-go so I don't forget it. And I forget size, no, pardon me? I forget the vacation to these devices. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you should switch and do it at the beginning. I just forget. <laughs> <laughs> and so I always like to develop the rotator interval, release the coracohumeral ligament, make a nice big space in there. And then I put this small dare retractor uh, in through the rotator interval. And the tip of that retractor is actually on the anterior portion of the humeral head. And I use that to lever the subscap forward. And um, by doing that, I put tension on the subscap. And tension's the key. I mean, general surgeons understand tension with respect to exposure much better than we do. And so as soon as you put tension on tissues, the tissues want to separate. And so this is just going to peel the subscapularis off. I mean, and I mean, Bill, you've done a randomized prospective study looking at uh, lesser tuberosity osteotomy versus tenotomy. Um, and I know you found no difference. And and you're you prefer the tenotomy now, from what Either I recall. Tenotomy or appeal. Yeah. And Joaquin, I know you prefer the uh, intrasubstance tenotomy. I do, and I do do a pill occasionally if it's a very, very tight shoulder, but most of the time she's tenotomy for me. Okay. And so, just, and, George, can I just say a technical pearl there? I love your, I love the way you you uh, lever the subscap. That's a nice trick. 
Uh, the other thing I do is I actually use different color sutures for the upper border of the subscap on both the medial and lateral side. Um, and that just helps me anatomically make sure I always put the subscap exactly back where it belongs. Sometimes it's easy to inferiorly translocate the subscap and not have it be right where you want. Uh, so it's just a nice little trick. So I use a white suture at the top and then three blue sutures in the uh, mid substance and, and you never have any question about where it goes. Bila, the term of closer, do you close the interval region or not? At, excuse me? Do you close the interval at the time of closure? I do, I do. Um, I, I, use, I have a six suture repair that I do in every single case minimum and sometimes a seventh and sometimes an eighth, but six for sure. So I, I know uh, I never used to close the rotator interval. And the main reason I've come to closing the rotator interval now is to keep the vancomycin powder within the joint. But also, uh, I mean, from a biomechanical perspective, there's been several biomechanical studies showing that even one or two stitches in that rotator interval protect your subscap. So uh, I, I've gone to close the interval. What about you, Joaquin? Yeah, I closed the interval. There is a great study from Germany looking at the, how much it increases the strength of repair. In that paper, it was, I think you remember right, close to 30%. To me, it's like a margin conversion should repair of the supra to the super capillary. So, uh, but some people don't like it because it may limit external rotation. Like for example, uh, Joaquin, Joaquin, it's just critical that you, your arm positions in at least 30 degrees of ER at the side. And, and the other thing is from a technical standpoint, you can put your rotator interval suture in. Uh, I, I actually do this. I put my tendon to tendon suture in at the top and I put my rotator interval suture in at the top uh, before I start the rest of the closure. So you're not trying to dig into the rotator interval into the supra after you've already paired your subscap. So you can put those sutures in before you actually um, uh, do the rest of your subscap repair. It's a nice trick. It's yeah, interesting. I, I saw um, John Sperling does something interesting where he actually, before he puts his humeral implant in, so he's done his glenoid, he's getting ready to put the humerus in, he'll put the, the rotator interval sutures in first, keep them loose, then put the implant in and then close the interval. Just to, yeah. Um, and so then, uh, so now this is an important part of glenoid exposure and you've always, I mean, I think I've, I can't remember who I first heard this from, but I mean, it's uh, glenoid exposure starts with exposure of the humerus. And so this is the critical portion right here is this inferior capsule release. And I think everyone does it a little bit differently. Uh, I do it exactly how I was taught by Bob Cofield, where as I'm doing the peel for the subscapulars, it just transitions into the inferior capsule and I remove it all in one big sleeve, going to six o'clock in a, a loose shoulder, but most shoulders are not loose. Uh, if it's any sort of uh, uh, restriction, external rotation, I go past six o'clock to the posterior inferior portion of the humeral head. George, um, when so you're teaching your resident or fellow, how do you handle the nerve at this point? What so uh, I use this retractor right here. So this, I transitioned from a small DARA to a, a medium DARA, and this is pushing down on the subscap. And the nerve is going from anterior obliquely to posterior. So by adducting, forward elevating the arm and external rotating, I'm bringing the humerus, rotating it anteriorly, so keeping the nerve posterior. So, I'm bring, so I don't let uh, myself go down deep, I bring the humerus, rotate it towards me. So I'm always working on the more anterior surface of the humerus. And so we'll play that video. So here you can see we're rotating. Uh, and then uh, here are some osteophytes get in the way. And I, I tend to remove these osteophytes as I see them because I find many times you remove them and you see capsular attachment underneath as you go more uh, inferior and more posterior. And sometimes I use a big rangeur and sometimes I use an osteotome. It's whatever my nurse gives me. And then as I adduct more and external rotate more and forward elevate more, you'll be able to see more of the posterior inferior portion of the humeral head. And so once we've done those releases all the way back, I very carefully dislocate the head. And what I do is I put the large dera into the joint to function essentially the skid to let the head slide out. And this should be a very atraumatic dislocation. And there, a little bit of uh, poor tendinous tissue there, and we're sort of a marker humeral head. Uh, I must admit, I, I, I initially started by doing uh, guide assisted cuts, and I've transitioned to doing uh, freehand cuts. And what I was doing there, I'll show that just for a second again. My 
finger right there is what I'm referencing is the, the bare spot and the maximum. So as the humeral head goes posteriorly and then it dips in for the bare spot, I aim my saw to that maximum posterior width of the head. Uh, and so that's, I was just referencing that area right there. And then I'll go ahead and aim to that. Yes. George, most, co most common error that your fellow or resident makes when they're doing a freehand cut? Uh, not take off enough head. Always. Yeah. And which is actually as, as errors go, it's, it's I, I would say that's a nice, cautious fellow. I like that. A, a very thoughtful person that takes off less head and you can always adapt it afterwards. The, the, I mean, the kiss of death is taking off the posterior cuff. Like do an over retroverted cut and take off the posterior cuff. So yeah. George, do you mark the uh, alignment of your cut yourself and then let the fellow do it? Or do you let them pick the points and then they do it? I let them uh, pick the points and then I move into, so uh, I used to let them pick the points. I'd lean over and look at it and let, let them do that. And then I missed things because I was looking at different angles. So now what I do is I let them pick the points. I move into the position they're standing and look at their points. And, and then I move to the top. So my vantage point is from the, uh, by the neck, by the head patient. So I can look down and see the angle of their saw and see their version that they're cutting at, and I can adjust it there. So I, I let them pick, I confirm, and I let them cut. Um, but you know, saying that, uh, I think guide-assisted cuts. There's nothing wrong with guide-assisted cuts, uh, in that, and I actually might go back to them. I find they are reproduced, especially if you have to, if you're using uh, a fixed head neck angle. I think a, a, a mono block or, or a fixed head angle head neck angle implant, I think a, a guide assisted cut's absolutely reasonable. And then, and there we go. And so I use preoptive planning software for uh, all of my arthroplasties. And so as soon as I take off the head, I measure it and bring in the, the head that I had planned. And so, oh, don't wanna let that escape. And that's it. That's up to the humors. Awesome. One other, one other uh, technical pearl, I, use, I take the plastic drape part that you use in arthroscopy, and I've always put that on my, on my drapes for uh, arthroplasties so that that head doesn't fall off, or if it does fall off, it falls into the bag, or if other things fall, that falls into the bag. So it's just a, another, another little trick. Yeah, I use the exact, so uh, use an arthroscopy drape. I, I use the same thing. This is an arthroscopy drape that I find it works so well for you know, catching instruments and everything else too. You want to stop sharing, uh, George, and I'll yep. take it. You got it. Okay. That was awesome. Now we're going to uh, keep going and talk about the glenoid. Uh, <laughs> This is these guys doing what they love to do most, and that's teach you all. So we're very privileged to have them. Uh, so these are my six steps. Know where the axillary nerve is, always. Uh, we're going to talk about the subscap capsule, capsulotomy versus capsulectomy. Uh, that's a big change in my practice over the last 20 years. Uh, retractors is where it's all at. That's what's going to be your best friend. And we'll go over that. And an arm position can help a lot with um, your glenoid exposure. So I'm just gonna change my little view here. So you have to know where the nerve is. You don't have to put a vessel loop around it. There are some surgeons that do that, but I don't think any of the three of us do it. Uh, you can palpate it, you can visualize it, but it, by all means, you have to protect it. You have to absolutely know where it is. And you guys as fellows will know when you're taking a resident through a case, or ultimately if you're in, in academics taking fellows through a case, this is where you learn uh, the word trust. Uh, when you have somebody with a sharp, dangerous object around the axillary nerve. Uh, that is the ultimate trust. Uh, so think about what we're going to do. This is what happens when you put a Fakuda retractor in. Your, your, your exposure is not very good. So you have limited exposure. So your posterior exposure is the, is the Fakuda. That's the first thing. So now we're going to separate the subscap and the capsule. And this is a case from last week that, that we took this picture. And I love this picture because you can see that you can actually, about 90% of the time, if there isn't significant scar tissue, you can separate the inferior one third of the subscap muscle from the capsule just with your finger. And then I just put in a narrow dera there uh, so that you can see exactly where we are. Can you see my uh, marker, right? my um, arrow right now? Mm -hmm. yes. Guys? yes. Yeah, so here, here you see the glenoid. 
Uh, here you see the subscap. This is the muscle fibers, and this is the capsule. Uh, and so this is just a beautiful, uh, easy way to very quickly uh, get to uh, that the differentiation between subscap and capsule. Can you go back one uh, slide? Yeah. That that is, I mean, what always happens, and I think I have to remind my fellows all the time, is that when they see master surgeons like you operate, they always see a perfect glenoid. But it never starts out that way. The first time you put your retractor in, glenoid exposure is a slow burn. It means you put your retractor in, you put some tension on, you do some work, you put a little more tension on, you do some work, you put, it, it's a slow burn. You have to be patient to get glenoid exposure. And that's, and I love that picture showing that it doesn't always start out with a perfect view. Well, and that's exactly why I wanted to show this picture because you know, I think that's what happens. And, you know, we all know that for residents, for example, that train in places where they don't do a lot of anatomic total shoulders and reverses, they don't see glenoid exposure. And a lot of uh, older surgeons and middle age surgeons actually went through training, never seeing the glenoid. They just didn't know how to get the exposure. So that's why when they transitioned, they probably had uh, less than stellar results because they just never re really learned how to get there. Okay, so here we're, we're separating subscap and capsule. And this is what's changed a lot. In the old days, I used to do a really aggressive capsulectomy, uh, and uh, now I do a very limited capsulectomy. So there's only three retractors that I use in every single shoulder arthroplasty, anatomic or reverse. These are my three go-to. Uh, George, what do you use? So I use a, a straight Dara, uh, and I call it Batman and Robin. So they're, it's very similar to your bank cart with a two-prong. I use a bank cart with a three-prong. Okay, and what do you use, uh, Joaquin? So similar to the Fukuda, like a modified Fukuda retractor that I have, a bent home like you have in the top, and then an anterior retractor that has three prongs also or two. So very similar. Okay. Very similar. Good. And then this I like to show, because this is, um, now here are the three retractors in real life. This is last week. So <clears throat> this is the Fukuda. This is the large Homan. And so that's one assistant holding that. And so this is the, uh, anterior bank cart being held to the drapes by a Kelly. So we call this the mechanical medical student. So you really, you know, we always hear, well, you have four assistants or eight assistants, but you really, you can do this whole case with one assistant very easily. And this is a nice little trick. Anything I, else I, you guys do? I do the exact same thing. I have uh, that anterior ba bank cart retractors attached to the arthroscopy drape, just as, you, as you've done it. Instead of a Fukuda, I use a straight Dara. The only thing I find is that Sometimes if you got inexperienced help, they pull equally on the Fukuda yeah. and equally on the Homan, but you got to tell them, no, the Homan, you got to pull just a little bit. The Fukuda, you got to pull a little bit more is what yeah. I find. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Uh, okay. So again, Fukuda, number one, not great visualization. Now we put in our 90 degree bank cart and pretty good visualization, right? <laughs> and then we put in our large Homan. And that's what we want to see every single time. That looks perfect. That's and perfect, what I yeah. want to what I want to point out here, this is with a cattle, this is a catalyst. So this is with the humeral head not removed. This is with the, the humeral head. And you know, people ask, well, if you're going to do this anterior humeral resurfacing, anatomic resurfacing, isn't that going to cause glenoid exposure problems? This is with a catalyst. This is what your exposure should look like. I don't care if you've taken the head off, done a classic resurfacing, or done this. Uh, chamfer uh, humeral resurfacing, uh, but this is what you, you should see. This is just a short video. Again, this is just from last week that we should. So I'm putting the, the uh, Fukuda in, put a, a Richardson retractor in, bring the subscap over, put that white suture in that we had talked about. Uh, here's the remnant of the biceps. So we'll cauterize the rest of that, or in this case, I think we cut it with the knife. Identify that inferior subscap capsule margin. And this one, it wasn't so easy. It didn't separate quite like the other picture I did. Uh, but there you see the separation of the capsule inferiorly versus the subscap. So that's the only capsule I remove, guys, is that lower inferior triangle. And then I just feel with my finger to make sure I have the pocket to put that anterior bank card in. So then the anterior bank card's in. We'll remove some labrum. We'll do an aggressive labrectomy. That's important. It also helps release some of the posterior contracture if you want to retract posteriorly. And that's what it should look like at the end. So for glenoid exposure, as I said, you can cut the head off, you can do a resurfacing classic, or you can do an anatomic chamfer, but it doesn't matter. The point of this for all the fellows is that your exposure should not be 
uh, in any way related to which type of humeral prosthesis you've done because the soft tissue releases that we're showing you that started with George and then continued with my part, that's what's gonna give you the exposure you need, not whether or not the head's there, the head's not there or any of the other stuff. And the only thing I'll also say, uh, as I mentioned about arm position, is that sometimes you'll see by externally and internally rotating, you'll either bring the arm into a good position or a bad position relative to what you're trying to do on the glenoid. And I'm, I'm sure that we'll see more of that with Joaquin. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing there. Uh, guys, did I miss anything that you would uh, wanna raise? No, I, was, I think the one thing I always uh, uh, remind my fellows and residents is, is when they're cutting out the remnant of the long head of biceps, make a mental note of where that superior pole is. I mean, it's not always at 12 o'clock, but it gives you an idea, especially for me, because I position them very low. So I have to remind them that the, the glenoid orientation is this way. And I think for you, for you guys, it obviously makes it more anatomically positioned at 50 and 70 degrees. So I just always remind them to keep a mental note of where that biceps was. All you, Joaquin. Thank you very much. So my part today is to uh, show uh, some uh, concepts and then how to implant an anatomic glenoid component in shoulder orthoplasty. And uh, something that I think we have to realize is that in my opinion, we are behind to some extent, meaning that we're still using an old polyethylene cemented component for the most part. Some components are hybrid, but I would argue that in the field of anatomic orthoplasty, we still have to do the jump in time that we have seen in hip and knee orthoplasty, because the truth is that these components do loosen. As you can see in this actually obtained 13 years after an anatomic shoulder orthoplasty. And they loosen because there is polyethylene wear, because the pecs break, and because the cement bone implant interface is poor. So our job as surgeons and for you fellows, you have to understand what matters to make these components survive the most. Realizing that the human glenoid is a very small bone. And the most important thing is to understand how to position the component in a space in three dimensions. And pre applying like Dr. Alval mentioned, is very important. These components need support. So you wanna have the back of the component perfectly contoured with your rimming, and you want them to sit on a strong subcondral bone. You don't want them to sit on weak cancellous bone. We also know that if you do a poor job with cementing and you get loose and lines in your first x-ray, the day after surgery, there is a higher chance of loosening. We also know that whenever the implant is loaded in the edge, that will really lead to either component rocking horse mechanism and loosening or polyethylene wear. Uh, so you want to avoid edge loading. And in that uh, um, uh, line of thought, it's important to understand the value that I think we have with mismatch components. So in terms of component selection, I think every company has now components that are great. Most of them have a curve back, which I think is more bone preserving. They have different features to optimize your cementing technique. They are bone preserving. They have good uh, features for polyethylene wear. Your job as a surgeon is to optimize technique. And that means you have to size the implant properly, orient the implant properly, win perfect, and at the same time be minimalistic, and make sure that when you do your cement application, there is no loosened lines. So this concept, I think, is important. In the shoulder joint, there is an obligatory translation of the humeral head in reference to the glenoid. Like in the knee joint, there is a translation between the tibia and the femur because of the contraction of the ACL and the PCL. So when we move the shoulder, for example, in elevation, there is combined elevation and translation of the humeral head in reference to the glenoid. The same thing is true with rotation. So if you rotate your shoulder, there's going to be some pivoted rotation and some translation. So guess what? If you choose an implant that has much components, most likely that's gonna facilitate edge loading. Because as the muscles of the shoulder try to replicate the motion of the human shoulder, translation cannot occur because the surfaces are perfectly matched. So in general, I prefer to use mismatch components where if the use of curvature of the glenoid is slightly larger than of the humeral head, when there is that motion of the shoulder, it does allow for that translation without edge loading. And there is at least one paper clinically and four biomechanical that support the use of mismatch components. So I tend to choose my glenoid component size based on the humeral head that I'm gonna be using. The second thing that is important is to avoid early loosened lines. And there is many tricks to do this, but most of the companies now have these type of pegs 
like the cortilo peg or the peg that the pew has in the central component, or this is the striker peg that have these ribs, and they are actually almost press fit, so that when you implant your cement, if you look at your postal picture, what you want to see is that there is no lines between the cement and the plastic and the bone. So that's important too as a goal. And then I cannot emphasize enough the value of pre-op planning. And it doesn't matter which company you use. I think that there are at least six to seven packages out there for software that are great. But you realize that when you look at x-rays, uh, you get a sense of the deformity. You take one step forward when you go to two-dimensional planning. Of course, that really helps. But the minute you get your CT scan in any of the uh, software packages that are available today and you start to plan, you really understand what you want to uh, aim for. And I was trained to always be in neutral for version. And I must say that now, I almost always put my components in some retro version. Now, in very, very extreme cases, I like to use 3D printing. And I would recommend that as you start your practice, if you have one of these complicated cases where you don't know exactly where you're going to function with, I think it's important to get a guide and print the bones because the value of having those 3D printed structures in the OR with you, I think is priceless. So now let's go to where Dr. Levine left, which is a very, very good exposure, which I think is difficult to get, but do we get in fellowship? I always try to go to the OR and tell my patient mentally, I want you to show me your glenoid, please. That's my goal today. Please show me your glenoid. Because if you have the view that Dr. Levine showed, then actually doing this operation is very fun. On the contrary, if you cannot get there, it's actually a struggle. So then I always mark the axis of the face of the glenoid in a case where I'm not using either mixed reality or any type of navigation or a guide. And the important thing is to remember that in many of the shoulders, the face of the glenoid is actually offset to the glenoid vault because of osteophytes. So once I mark my axis, I go back to the CT scan or my planning, and I really remember where are the osteophytes because you want to place the glenoid in the center of the vault, not in the center of the face. And then because I like mismatching, I'm going to try to match the size of the glenoid component to the humeral head. So you can see how in this particular example where there is six minutes of mismatch, you have some translation. This is even 10 millimeters, some more translation. I'm going to do in this case a 48 glenoid. And I'm going to confirm that if I choose that size, which is larger for this patient, I still have support, which is important. Now, this is an A1 glenoid. I didn't want to show something complicated. So in an A1 glenoid, it's actually somewhat easy to get your guide pin where you want. You almost go perpendicular to the face in both places with just a little bit of retroversion and a little bit of superior inclination. And then this is the trick, balanced rimming. You want to get a perfect contour, but you don't want to go into weak bone. So the minute I have a perfect surface, I stop. You're not looking for ingrow. You're looking for bone support of your plastic. And I prefer to use uh, pet components for the most part, but I must admit that in the very small uh, female patients, I typically use a heel component because with pet, there'll be perforation, which I think is controversial, but ideally would prefer to avoid it if at all possible. So we're going to prepare the pegs for the two inferior pegs and then the central and the superior peg, and then we're going to head on trial. And even though um, we talk in meetings about wanting 70% support, 80% support, in the ideal world, I want 100% support. I want that component to be solid so that when you place the component in the bone, there is no space between the component and the glenoid bone. And if you try to rock it, it just feels great because you have a perfect contour. It's a curve, actually, and you have your pec support in you. I like to use pulsar dye lavage, and I always mix methylene blue with my cement so that if I do revision, um, I will be able to identify the cement easily if there is an infection. And I do not place cement between the plastic and the face of the glenoid. And now that's controversial, but I only place cement in the pegs. And I do cement all four pegs, even for those components where there is claims that bone ingrowth happened to polyethylene. I don't fully buy that. So I cement always all four pegs. And then I confirm that I have nice sitting and move on. Now, two problems can happen now. That posterior Fukuda like retractor can dislodge your component. So as a fellow, as you remove this retractor, make sure that you have your thumb on the component. Number two, we are going to rotate the arm. The great velocity can do the same thing. So I always pull on the arm and use a bone hook so that the humerus is translated laterally before rotating. And if you get an nice reconstruction, I think that anatomy plastic beats knee replacement, shoulder, uh, knee replacement, and many others. I think we're very lucky 
with the outcomes that we get in these patients. So in summary, remember that the components we use today, because they are all body cemented, they are actually a visual failure. So our job as surgeons and your job when you graduate from your fellowship is to make sure that you get it perfect. Thank you very much. Excellent. Any comments or questions? Do you guys do anything different? I was curious, what, uh, what sort of material, suture material do you use to close? Like, do you, do you close the delta vector approach? What do you use subjectively these I, staples? I don't use the delta vector, I don't use the delta vector approach. I just let it basically overlap. And for the skin, I use two a monocryl, a running three monocryl and a steady stitch. That's what I use. I put, I put three Tevdex sutures in the delta pecs just so they're land, landmarks in case we have to come back. Uh, and then do I, a multi-layered closure ending in a, a subcuticular closure. We use a uh, skin glue and a Tegaderm uh, dressing and that stays on for 14 days. And then I just have the patient peel that. The first visit's always telehealth now with how much telehealth we're doing. So I just have the patient peel it off in front of me so I can see what the wound looks like. Uh, you know, guys, we the one thing we didn't include and I, I'm, I think we're remiss in this is let's just talk about subscap closure and what we're doing because that has changed with, with the evolution to stemless I had to actually change my subscap approach. And I found this out the hard way, which is what fellows are gonna have happen when they go into practice and realize that something has changed from you know along the way. And so when I used to cut the head off, uh, as George mentioned, we did that prospective randomized trial. So our trans, the, the typical repair was a tendon to tendon plus transosseous sutures. And when I didn't cut the head off anymore, I wasn't able to, I wasn't doing the transosseous and I was just doing the tendon to tendon repair. And I had some early subscap failures that I had not had uh, in my previous, you know, million arthroplasties done the old way. So now what I do is I put two 4.5 millimeter uh, plastic anchors, peak anchors into the subscap footprint. Uh, and so those are doubly loaded anchors. So that's four sutures that I mentioned. Uh, in each pair, I have one white and one blue suture. So the white suture is passed in a modified Mason Allen, just so we have a routine so that the team understands. And the blue is passed in suture, uh, excuse me, in simple fashion. So that's the two on the inferior. And then we do the same thing superiorly. Then we do one tendon to tendon suture at the top and one rotator interval. So those are my six sutures. And then depending upon the situation, I may add another if, if there's room. But I, I think that's important to talk about how we're fixing our subscaps. What are you guys doing? So really quick question because I didn't follow that fully. So you, you use two anchors in the lesser velocity. Correct. And so then one, in the, one, in the one in the superior part of the footprint and one in the inferior part of the footprint. Um, so you're gonna have, and they're doubly loaded. So four sutures um, and, uh, and then two additional sutures that are gonna be at the upper border subscap and rotator interval. So do you also use sutures that are truly tendon to tendon, like in the classic near fashion, or to supplement that, or do you, is that being repaired? No, so I, the sutures from the anchors, um, at least the upper two, I'll pass through the lateral part of the subscap if I've done a true tenotomy, and then through the medial part of the actual tendons, just so there is some tendon to tendon. But those are primarily tendon to bone anchors, uh, uh, sutures. I, have a, I actually have a quick video I could show you right now uh, on how I do it. Great. And uh, so this is the same technique. Does that, is that coming across? Yes. So this is the same technique, whether I'm doing an L repair of an LTO uh, or repair of a peel. And so basically this is, we're just trialing our implants here. Um, and I always uh, essentially pass all my sutures uh, for my repair. So I'm just going to debride the lesser tuberosity there. I put four drill holes in the biceps groove. That's the best quality, hardest bone. And then what I do is once I grab my subscap here and I'm gonna put three number two high strength fiber sutures in an inverted horizontal mattress technique. So this is the upper third of the subscap. This is the middle third of the subscap. And I usually paint this one a different color. So that one's blue, so the middle third and then the inferior third. So we have six strands, but there's three sutures. So they're all horizontal mattress. And then what I do is I, pass the first strand from the first suture through that hole number one and out the greater tuberosity. I double load the second tunnel. So the second strand from the first suture, the first strand from the second suture, double load tunnel number three and single load tunnel number four. So these are all passed 
in through the biceps groove out the greater tuberosity. And so when you tension them, it's also functions like a tension band. So as this patient externally rotates, it compresses the subscap up against the lesser tuberosity. So I passed all my sutures, I'll put in my implant and I'll just show the repair in just a, a minute. So I passed all my sutures first, put the implant in. This is a stemless implant. And then put the head on. Give it a hit. And so, and now I have, as I pull them, it's gonna essentially pull the, the subscap over and I tie over a plate. And the reason I tie over a plate is it just functions as a washer. And so I, I tie the middle one, pardon me? That's a beautiful repair. And so this is a repair that we've been, Peter Lapner and I published on this repair in JBS. We have two papers on this with over 200 patients. And it's actually a very strong repair. And as you can imagine, because it's an inverted horizontal mattress, as you externally rotate, the sutures actually compress the tendon down to the lesser tuberosity. And so there's the, the, the vancomycin powder right in the joint and then closure of the rotator interval right there. And I think something we don't emphasize to our fellows and residents enough is what Bill mentioned. If you don't release that inferior capsule, the subscap is so stiff that you can do the best possible repair and probably it has a high chance of failure. So mobilizing the subscap is also important, like we do in rotator cuff repair. So that that to me contributes to the success of the subscap that is healing. It's interesting. I actually close the delta pectoral interval, and, and you guys both don't. You just tag it. I wonder if I should. No, no, no. Stop I, doing that. I no, I do close it, George. Three, okay. three, right. with three sutures. I typically don't. Even for reverses, Joaquin? Yeah, even for reverses, I typically don't. I place my skin incision, as you said, pretty lateral, so my skin closure is actually on the deltoid. Mm -hmm. I think those will be too. So I have found that those two muscles overlap, and I haven't had major issues with hematoma or seroma. I don't think I've ever taken a patient, you know, no good to the OR for a hematoma despite doing that, and I, I don't use any drains. I think also TXA obviously helps. Do you use TXA IV or topical? I use TXA IV twice. I use one gram at the time of incision and another at the time of closure. Exactly what are the you, same. Bill? Exactly uh, the same. Okay, I might change because I use it once at the time of incision, but I don't use it at the time of closure. And I actually might change and start doing that tomorrow, actually. <laughs> All right. Well, this was great, guys. I learned a lot. It was uh, George, an absolute thank pleasure. George and Joaquin, thanks for doing this. Um, I think this will be a great addition to our, our part one. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks.